Referendum's eyes defeat was a heartbreaker for the GLBT community and its absence leaves those citizens without some important protections. Here's Fawn Oates to explore what happened to the measure and what LGBT citizens can do to, under current law to protect themselves and their partners. For many people, November 7th was full of mixed emotions. However, for most gay Coloradans, it was a devastating loss. With the passage of Amendment 43 and the dissolution of Referendum I, the gay community once again found itself wondering if, when our civil rights may be achieved, like so many other minority groups have before. We are left with several important questions. What went wrong with this campaign? How do we do with the possible feelings of depression, isolation, and perhaps bitterness that many of us are left with? And how do we protect ourselves and our families within the legal system we currently have? Here to help us sort through this difficult time, we have Beth Bryant, an attorney who practices exclusively in the areas of estate planning and probate. Ms. Bryant received her law degree from the University of Denver College of Law in 1990. She is a member of the Colorado Denver Colorado Women's and Colorado Gay Bar Associations. She is a frequent presenter on the topic of estate planning for non-traditional families to public and professional groups. We also have with us Phil Campbell, an ordained, excuse me, an ordained minister and director of ministry studies at the Iliff School of Theology. He is the founder of Colorado Clergy for Equality and Marriage. Welcome both. Thank you. Glad Good you could to be, be here good. tonight. Thank you. Well, at times during this election, during this whole campaign, it seemed like we actually were winning. Uh, numbers looked good. It seemed that things were going well. What kind of events, and Phil, I'm going to start with you, what kind of events do you think might have had an impact on this campaign? Well, I think one of the things that's important to remember, even amid the disappointment and the letdown after the loss of Referendum I and the passage of Amendment 43, are that even though we lost these things, um, if you put it in the context of even two years ago, Colorado did much better than any state did of the 14 that had uh, issues on their ballots in 2004. Now that may be small solace, but I also think that it means that um, the arc of justice is moving in the right direction. It may be long, but uh, the arc of history bends toward justice. And I think we saw it bend a bit further this time. And so I think we need to remember that and put our disappointment in that kind of context. We also need to be able to acknowledge that some things went very right. Um, the very fact that we thought that we could put referendum I on the ballot and it had a good chance to win is really quite remarkable when you think about it. That Three years ago, even, we would not have fathomed the possibility that we might have won a domestic partnership referendum. Uh, the first, so uh, even the so, fact that we came close, is what you're saying, I even think the fact so. that we came close I think is, that, is quite a victory. Again, I want to I acknowledge that it's small solace. It sure. doesn't mean that there are more rights available for uh, gay couples now. And that's certainly uh, nothing to uh, be dismissive of. And so I don't want to... Um, to gloss over the disappointment or to acknowledge uh, the real tangible economic um, deprivation that continues uh, for gay households in Colorado. But having said that, I think there's encouragement that we're moving in the right direction. There was also um, early polls that suggested that referendum I would win. And that was the hope. <laughs> yeah, that's the hope. And um, I think what has um, been the case and what we've seen in terms of some early polling are that there are people that for whatever reason are not quite ready to do the right thing. They know what the right thing is and so when they talk to the pollster they're going to tell them what the right thing is but then in the privacy of the polling booth they don't do it. But maybe but, uh, next time they will. I, I, I agree. But do you think that that was a problem that people were kind of lying about what they were going to support? I don't know if they were lying so much as maybe not acknowledging. Um, to me, what happened was really more of a perfect storm type of situation. Mm -hmm. I, I do believe that we had a real shot at passing I and was very optimistic about it. I think that with the New Jersey case, Supreme Court case, as well as the Ted Haggard matter, um, I think it caused people to pause. I think the Haggard matter unfortunately made people feel uh, uncomfortable. And I believe that the, both of those events had something to do with the, the defeat of I.
And back to you, Phil. Uh, Ted Haggard was a, was a fairly important religious figure. Um, and I believe some people thought that, well, maybe that will show the religious right that even religious people can be gay. That didn't seem to be how it played out. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I really think it's too early to tell. It happened so close to the election that whatever um, impact it may or may not have had on the election, I think was a more uh, visceral, reactive, uh, emotional um, response. Mm -hmm. And it, it very well uh, be, uh, as Beth said, that it was a negative one. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it was a conscious, reasoned one. Also, um, the fact of the matter is Mr. Haggard has never really admitted yet publicly what his um, darkness is. And so I don't want to suggest that I know that. It, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that uh, there's something obvious about it. But uh, it may be that his darkness is uh, an acknowledgement that uh, he doesn't know how to live in a committed relationship. And I think one of the things it points out is that laws do not protect marriage. Love and commitment protect marriage. Right. We've had a, um, the Defense of Marriage Act on the books in Colorado since 2000. Well, unfortunately, that didn't protect Mr. Haggard's marriage, and it doesn't protect a lot of marriages. I haven't so, seen the divorce rate um, go down because that's of right. Uh, there's there's been no uh, there's no, no impact on the divorce rate. So, mm -hmm. so on one level, there's that. Uh, there's also, I think, uh, for many people who fundamentally believe there's something wrong with being gay, mm -hmm. um, they're still ensconced in um, that uh, misperception and that really uh, self-hatred, I think. And that's a tragic thing. It seems like we've seen the most negative uh, aspects of, of, of homosexuality. Mark Foley, um, you know, with, with the 16-year-old Paige or 15-year-old Paige, uh, Mark Taggart, it just doesn't seem like what has come out in the media are positive images. We see more the negative side. Is that affecting people's view of, of gay people? What do you think, Beth? Perhaps, and I think it also depends on the on the folks that who um, the age group. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm looking at. I think it is generational, and it may affect some my parents' generation, mm -hmm. but I certainly don't think it affects my nieces and nephews, and I don't think it is an issue for them. It's a non-issue. We have to wait till they can vote. I'm I'm banking on it. And I'm, they actually start voting. Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe at that time they're 30. That's <laughs> that is that is my hope and my belief. All 17 of my nieces and nephews will be good voters, I think. And this brings us to to this idea of how do we deal with this this problem, or how do we deal with the fact that we just saw in in actual numbers how many people were against us as the gay community? How do we sit with that, Phil? What is your idea? Well, I think. First of all, again, I want to say that um, it, there are also a lot of people who voted for equal rights mm. and voted for um, uh, dignity in relationships. And so we had over 650,000 Coloradans that voted for referendum I. We had over 600,000 Coloradans who voted against the discriminatory, discriminatory amendment 43. Mm. Um, those weren't the majorities, but I think it's important to remember that um, uh, the community is not alone, mm -hmm. and that uh, it's not as if uh, there is uh, no support, and there's not, not this growing movement of commitment to equality. So we need to build on that. I think the way we need to build on that is to reframe the debate and really claim the important values that uh, strengthen relationships and uh, make for um, healthy and flourishing households. Part of the campaign was run as a negative campaign in the sense that we wanted to make sure that people knew, for instance, in referendum I, it was not marriage. Well, sometimes I think that can create subtly the suggestion that there would be something wrong if it were marriage. Right. And so that we buy into a values frame that suggests there's still something not quite right about these relationships. I think we, as we move forward, separate but equal, uh, separate I mean, but equal. Yeah. Kind of and so that we really want to say that whatever we call it, we want to really just emphasize equal rights. Mm -hmm. And we want to emphasize um, love and commitment and dignity and relationships. And we want to say that the state has a role to play in this. And that is providing uh, these basic legal protections. 
not the only role. There are individual roles. There are roles in terms of our communities of friends and supporters and those kinds of things. But uh, really to just emphasize the positive and say this is about equal rights and not what it's not about. As far as Amendment 43 goes, it was a difficult campaign because this was already the law in Colorado. And so what we were doing was trying to not add insult to injury by putting it in the Constitution. But it really wasn't a referendum on the possibility of same-sex couples achieving marriage. And so um, we, again, were by definition having to fight a reactive campaign. So I think as we go forward, what we want to do is to really establish um, the value and the importance of equal rights mm. and a commitment to equal protection under the law that um, should be available to everyone in our country and to really c reclaim that as a bedrock value of our society and, uh, and not apologize for that. Absolutely. And, and we also want to say that uh, what is good for relationships and families and households is good for relationships and families and households and to discriminate against families based on sexual orientation is just plain un-American. So let's talk about what we're for not just what we're against. And I think those are some wise words, things we can all take. And what part of what you were saying and, and something I've had to keep telling myself is that we really haven't lost anything we haven't gained anything, mm -hmm. but we really haven't lost anything. Um, and, and that's important because it feels like such an incredible mm -hmm. loss right now. Um, what are your thoughts? You know, about? I actually am, uh, I continue to be an optimist. I, I believe that just from the straight but not narrow allies that I have spoken with during the campaign and after the election, um, I feel very very good about the prospects. I think that having lived through the amendment two days and realizing at that point in time uh, that people needed to know us and many of us um, who may have been closeted came out and decided that we would let people know that we were their neighbors, their co-workers and their friends and I honest, honestly believe that that has made a significant difference and I think it will continue to do so. And maybe that's one of the things we actually we did gain, that we did gain some visibility. Mm -hmm. And we got uh, the, the community talking about it, and we found more, a lot more allies. Uh, so there, there are positives. Mm -hmm. Just have to remember those. <laughs> um, what kind of, of reaction do we see from the religious side about this, this uh, election, from the religious community? Well, one of the things I think is important whenever we talk about um, the religious response or the religious mm -hmm. perspective is to remember that there are a variety of perspectives. And one of the things that I've um, said on occasion and I'll repeat now is, <laughs> is to say that um, to think about or to ask the question, what is the religious perspective, uh, really doesn't make any more sense than asking, what is the political perspective? as if there would only be one political perspective on That's something. True. Well, there's, n there's never just one religious perspective. Yeah. I uh, founded a clergy organization, Colorado Clergy for Equality in Marriage, and I'm joined by over 125 of my colleagues across the state in this commitment to marriage equality. And we're committed to marriage equality because of our faith, not in spite of it. And I think that this is a really important word to continue to uh, proclaim. And I think people are really um, relieved to know that there are religious people, there are spiritual people, there are communities of faith um, that really are rooted in love, uh, that uh, have a commitment to inclusion and equality and full participation of persons um, of different sexual orientations. And that um, fundamentally when we talk about uh, love being uh, the essence of um, a good life, a spiritual life, an ethical life. It's not about who we love, it's about how we love. And, and that, there are many religious communities that affirm that. Certainly there are others that don't. And part of it is to try to continue to widen that circle, uh, continue to um, uh, increase the dialogue. And I think even when we look at those who oppose us and have different views on this, um, I think there's less vitriol in the, um, the exchange. And I think there's more acknowledgement of the basic humanity of, um, of gay people. And I think that that's really important for everyone to remember, that not only are gay people everywhere, our allies are everywhere too. And not to just write off specific groups as, as 
Absolutely. As you were saying. Mm -hmm. well, we're, we're running out of time a little bit, and I really want to talk to, to Beth about some of the legal aspects mm -hmm. of what can we do now? What are some of the problems that we're facing, and what are some of the solutions? Well, and, and uh, I would have a lot, um, my comments would be a lot different if I had passed. As, as we all know, that would have solved a lot of issues. Um, basically, the laws were not written contemplating gay couples or gay individuals. And the, the pre my practice area is estate planning and probate. So I'm helping people with documents during their lifetime and also to deal with, with issues when they die. Sure. And it's, it is um, not fun. It's not a fun topic for most folks to, to come to me and talk with uh, about. But it's really important and it's very, it's, it's very needed for our community until a referendum I type of law is, is in fact passed, which I believe it will. There are so, certain things that I can okay. do and certain things that I can't do, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, my partner and I, you know, uh, this was a very personal election sure. because it would have meant health insurance for my partner. So what could we do um, in terms of, of keeping ourselves safe? Probably during your lifetime, the most mm -hmm. important documents that you can have uh, would be a medical power of attorney. And that's a document that simply says, this is who I want to make medical decisions for me if I can't. Mm -hmm. The law does provide, has default rules. I mean, all state laws have, states have default rules for their citizens when there aren't documents in place to, to state who they, who a person wants to make decisions. And actually, our law is, is very, um, is one of the few in the country where a gay partner is contemplated, not specifically, but in the event, let's say that I'm, real quickly, I'm in a car accident and I don't have a medical power of attorney in place. The law says, well, is there a spouse? No. And, and I would have changed that to say spouse or domestic partner. Right. Are there adult children? For me, no. Are there parents? Yes. Siblings? Yes. Friends. So my partner comes in in the friend category. In the fifth and, category. In the fifth category. But that's really not a priority so much. Um, the good news is if those folks can agree, who makes decisions for me, and if they're all in agreement that my partner can, she will be able to. But where it runs into difficulty is if there's disagreement. And that's the Terry Schiavo case, essentially, mm. as well. Family members disagreeing and saying, no, I should be the one. And in that event, my partner would have to petition the court to be able to make the decision. So and if my partner's family was not, did not acknowledge me as her partner, right. they really would have the power yes. if something happened to her. Well, it, then it, it, going to court, the court would have to decide what's in your best interest. And mm -hmm. so there would be a hearing, and the problem is it's not certain mm -hmm. how a judge would rule, and it's also very costly. So, so is there anything that we can do to actually solve have, something? Yes, have a medical power of attorney, and they're recognized in, in all jurisdictions in Colorado and, and frankly, in other states uh, and outside of the country. Uh, another document that I think is probably the most important during a lifetime um, as well is a financial power of attorney mm -hmm. because there, there are no, the default rules are very unfriendly with respect to finances. There is no, is there a spouse, are there adult children, as with the health decisions, either I've got someone on my account or I don't. And if I don't, no one can touch my assets and then someone has to go to court. And once again, it opens the door for my family to come in and say, no, we don't want her to be the one to make decisions. We want to be the ones to make those for our daughter or our sister or whomever. So uh, medical power, financial power. Living will is another document that's a real narrow subset. It is basically, to, to put it bluntly, a pull the plug document mm -hmm. that says if all of these facts are present, including that I'm dying, it's time to let me go. And that, once again, it's a self-determination issue more than my naming someone to make that decision for me. But um, that's an important document. Sure. During um, one of the things that I've encountered um, that is very tough is if I died, um, and I've had this happen with clients, uh, unfortunately, when they have passed away, unless there's a writing that says I name this person to be able to make the, the decisions regarding the disposition of my body, whether it's cremation or burial, mm -hmm. um, my family is the, de the default rule once again, and my partner mm -hmm. would be absolutely um, unable to make those decisions. Um, those are lifetime documents that are very important. What about in terms of property and shared property? Great question, um, because once again, um, during life, one of the benefits of I would be that if there was a dissolution of the relationship, which does unfortunately happen um, in, in our world as well as the straight world, um, that the divorce rules would apply. And it's a consistent set of identifiable rules on how property would be divided. And 
since we don't have referendum I, there is just a dispersed uh, set of rules from different parts of the law, real estate to deal with the real estate that, you, that, that my partner and I might own together. Mm -hmm. And the rules are not necessarily uniformly um, upheld. <laughs> upheld throughout the state of Colorado. Mm -hmm. And the problem uh, is if I put my partner on title to my assets today, and if our relationship dissolves six months from now, if I then say to her, hey, remember six months ago when I put you on title to the property, would you deed it back to me? She can basically say, sure, I would if you pay me half of the value. So the problem with just putting someone on title is, is you make a gift to them by law. Is it's deemed to be a gift, and it's an irrevocable gift. And so it can cause problems because we don't have mm. the divorce rules. There are also some tax ramifications that are separate. So and even when we are taking care of ourselves, there are problems with that as well. Yes. But what you can do um, is... is for example, if you want to make sure that your partner is the beneficiary or receives a bank account, you can do what's called a payable on death designation. And that is a designation that the asset is yours during your lifetime, but at your passing, it goes to who you've designated. It's similar to a retirement plan uh, designation or a life insurance designation. Well, those are all very, very good ideas. And I'm, thank you both for giving me a little bit of hope as well. Um, thank you all for joining us, and have a great night. Bye-bye. Yeah.